In less than a century, more than 5,000 square kilometers of land in the southern United States have disappeared. Not because of war, not because of earthquakes, but because of the very structures built to protect it. The footage you are about to see does not capture a sudden disaster. It shows how a delta is slowly coming apart, quietly, piece by piece. The Mississippi Delta was once called the greatest flood defense stronghold in the United States. Higher levees, deeper channels, more dams. Billions of dollars were poured in to control the river. Yet instead of being saved, the delta began shrinking faster than ever. Sediment was cut off. Salt water pushed inland for dozens of miles. Marshes died in place. And every year, the map of America had to be redrawn without anyone making an announcement. Why did a so-called engineering masterpiece built to protect America end up quietly turning land, homes, and the future of downstream communities into open water? And who will be next to pay the price? Let us take a closer look. Along the Mississippi River in the southern United States, long artificial ridges stretch toward the horizon. They are straight, uniform, and silent. These are flood control levees. From a distance, they look like the backbone of modern civilization, built to keep water exactly where it belongs. But those straight lines open the door to another story, deeper and far more unsettling. After the Great Flood of 1927, when vast areas were submerged and hundreds of thousands of people lost their homes, the nation made a decisive choice. The Mississippi would no longer be allowed to roam freely. Control of the river was handed to the United States Army Corps of Engineers, and from that point on, one of the largest levee systems on Earth took shape. More than 5,600 kilometers of main levees now run along the river, supported by control channels and floodways, turning a once wild river into something measured, predicted, and operated by plane. From an engineering standpoint, it looked like success. Floods were restrained, cities were protected, the economy grew. But the Mississippi is not a machine, it is a living system, and for thousands of years it survived through one essential cycle. Water overflowed its banks, sediment spread into wetlands, land was rebuilt. Then the process began again. The levees ended that cycle. Once the river was forced to stay within its channel, sediment was no longer allowed to spread outward. What once fed the delta was trapped behind earthen walls or carried straight out into deep water. The Mississippi still flows, but the delta below began to starve. Not for water, but for the very material that created it. Satellite images from federal agencies reveal a difficult truth. In less than a century, coastal Louisiana has lost roughly 4,800 square kilometers of land. An area comparable to an entire small state has vanished, not all at once, but slowly and quietly, as if someone were erasing it from the map with a pencil. Here is the paradox. The higher the levees, the safer people feel. Believing the water is locked behind walls, development moves closer to the river. Homes, roads, and factories rise where wetlands once absorbed waves and wind. Scientists call this the levee effect, a false sense of safety that actually increases real risk. When a storm large enough exceeds design limits, the damage does not simply return. It multiplies. Meanwhile, the delta loses its natural armor. Marshes once slowed water and weakened storms. As they disappear, water moves farther inland, faster, and strikes directly where people live. The most frightening part is not the numbers, but the silence of the process. No explosions. No dramatic collapse, just land turning into water, year after year. From above, the Mississippi today looks like a body braced straight with metal supports. Natural bends are gone, replaced by rigid lines. The river still passes through America, but it is no longer allowed to do what created it. And this is only the surface layer. Beneath these flood walls, other straight lines exist, narrower, sharper, far more dangerous. They do not appear on tourist maps, but they stand out clearly from satellite images and they are cutting into the heart of the delta in ways the levees never could. Under the morning sun, standing at ground level, it is hard to notice anything unusual. The water looks calm. Marsh grass sways gently in the breeze, but rise just a few hundred meters into the air, and the picture changes immediately. The Mississippi Delta appears like a body cut open by thousands of straight, parallel lines, cold and unnatural. These are not rivers, not old bayous, they are artificial canals. They were quietly carved beginning in the middle of the 20th century when the American South entered its energy boom. To bring drilling rigs, pipelines, and barges deep into the marsh, narrow channels were cut as straight as a ruler line. On paper, each canal looked like a minor technical detail, 
Taken together, they formed a network stretching tens of thousands of kilometers, slicing through land that had taken thousands of years to form. What shocks many people is how quickly the damage appeared. Each new canal became a doorway for salt water from the Gulf of Mexico to move inland. Salt water does not arrive dramatically. It does not break levees or sweep away houses. It simply changes the salinity of soil and water. For marshes, that is a slow death sentence. Cypress forests die standing. Grasses that once held soil together begin to rot. When roots disappear, the land loses its grip and after just a few windy seasons and tidal cycles, whole sections of marsh dissolve into open water. Scientists at the United States Geological Survey describe this with a blunt term, wetland unzipping. Marshes are pulled apart like a zipper, tearing outward from each canal. Data show that areas with dense oil and gas canals lose land many times faster than areas left intact. The delta does not collapse in a single moment. It is dismantled layer by layer. The surface tells only part of the story. The rest lies beneath people's feet. Decades of oil and gas extraction have altered pressure inside the delta's soft sediments. Satellite radar data from NASA show that areas such as Lafourche and Barataria are sinking by several millimeters each year. That number sounds small, but in a place where even slight changes in elevation decide whether land remains land or becomes sea, it marks the difference between survival and disappearance. The consequences quickly reach daily life. Rural roads begin to sit lower than the water around them. Old pipelines rise above the surface as the ground sinks away. Freshwater wells turn salty. Boat docks are relocated again and again within the same generation. One Bayou resident once said that the place he remembered as forest in his childhood is now nothing but open water reflecting the sky. On newer maps, another term has appeared, one that sounds almost ghostly, ghost canals. These are channels abandoned long ago, no longer serving any purpose, yet still wide open to saltwater intrusion. Most are no longer part of any managed system. There are no projects to fill them, no maintenance budgets. The Delta lives with the legacy of straight lines long forgotten. From satellite images, these cuts stand out like scars on skin. They do not create disasters the way television usually tells them. There is no single date, no moment when everything collapses on camera. Each year, the line between land and sea simply moves a little farther inland, and salt water inches closer to where people live. If levees lock the river from above, these canals quietly bled the delta from the side. They were products of growth, of energy, of decisions that were legally approved. But laid side by side and seen from above, they tell another story. A place not destroyed by one decisive blow, but slowly sliced apart until there was nothing left to hold. Once those small cuts opened paths for the sea to move inland, people began digging larger, deeper, straighter channels so goods could move faster to the world. Those channels carried oil and cargo. They also carried pieces of Mississippi away from the place that created it. From above, among the web of small cuts across the delta, one line stands wider, deeper, and more decisive than the rest. It is not quiet like oil canals. It was designed to be seen, surveyed, dredged, and marked clearly on navigation charts. This is the route dug so commerce could reach the sea faster. In the middle of the 20th century, driven by the ambition to shorten shipping times and turn New Orleans into an even greater trade gateway, a commercial channel was cut straight from the Mississippi River to the Gulf of Mexico. It became known as the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet. On blueprints, it looked like a triumph of modern economics. Shorter distance, larger ships, lower costs. Not a single line mentioned marshes. Within a few years, troubling changes appeared. Water in the channel did not move in just one direction. It pulled salt water from the gulf deep into land once protected by wetlands and forest. Trees died. Areas that slowed storm waves turned bare. The delta lost another layer of protection, without the need for a storm. Here is the cold reality. Once a canal is opened, it does not remain passive. It becomes part of the system. In calm weather, it serves commerce. When storms form offshore, it becomes a perfect path for storm surge. Engineers later gave it a haunting name, a hurricane highway. Not because it creates storms, but because it gives them the shortest path straight into neighborhoods. That truth became painfully clear during Hurricane Katrina. When the storm struck the Gulf Coast, seawater did not simply rise. It rushed directly through the channel into low-lying communities around New Orleans. Places once shielded by wetlands took the full force of the surge. The canal was later closed, but lost land cannot be recovered. Dead forests do not return because of an administrative decision. The Mississippi River Gulf outlet became a symbol of another paradox. A project approved to boost the national economy ultimately increased the exposure of entire communities to risk. There was no conspiracy, no malicious intent, just a calculation missing one critical variable, wetlands. And Mamargo was not an exception. 
Along the lower Mississippi, other shipping lanes were widened and dredged to accommodate ever larger vessels. Each dredging made channels deeper and currents stronger. The remaining sediment was swept straight into deep water instead of settling across the delta. In economic reports, this looked like growth. On ecological maps, it looked like drainage. The effects reached daily life. In Plaquemines Parish, farmland was abandoned after saltwater contamination. Roads sank. Older levees no longer stood high enough against new water levels. One local resident said that a place once dozens of miles from the sea could now be reached by boat in a short trip through salty water. On nighttime satellite images, shipping routes glow like artificial veins. They carry grain, fuel, and goods around the world. At the same time, they carry away what little sediment remains, leaving its birthplace behind. The Mississippi has been turned into a massive commercial pipeline, where speed matters more than renewal. Once shipping canals opened the door for the sea, the question was no longer whether to develop. It became how development was chosen. And far upstream, where other concrete walls still hold the river's rhythm in place, that story continues quietly, but no less decisively. Far from the marshes that are steadily retreating into the sea, the Mississippi River begins in places that look almost harmless, calm reservoirs, tall concrete dams, straight and solid. Water is held back and released on schedule at precise levels. From an engineering standpoint, this is the picture of order and control. Yet it is in these quiet places that the river's heartbeat was changed. Throughout the 20th century, across the Mississippi-Missouri-Ohio River system, hundreds of dams, large and small, were built to prevent floods, generate power, and keep flows steady year-round. Each project had a reasonable purpose. Each decision aimed to reduce risk for people. But every concrete wall also trapped something else, quietly and rarely discussed. Sediment. Sediment is the river's memory. Tiny particles of soil, worn away from mountains, plains, and riverbeds, then carried downstream during high water each year. For thousands of years, this fragile material fed the land, lifted marshes, and built the Mississippi Delta. When dams appeared, that memory was stopped inside reservoirs. Water continued to flow. The soil stayed behind. Long-term studies by the United States Geological Survey show that the amount of sediment reaching the lower river has dropped sharply compared with the era when the river was free to flood its banks. The Mississippi became cleaner, clearer, but that clarity is the sign of a system growing hungry. Without enough material to rebuild itself, the soft land at the river's end began sinking faster than nature could replace it. Here lies the paradox. The more dams, the fewer floods spill over the banks. The fewer floods, the less sediment reaches the delta. And when sediment disappears, the delta sinks lower relative to rising seas. The Mississippi was turned into a programmed river, with gates opening and closing on engineering schedules rather than seasonal rhythm. From the air, reservoirs look peaceful, like landscape paintings, flat water reflecting sunset light. But beneath those surfaces, hundreds of millions of tons of mud are accumulating. What once sustained the downstream land is now trapped forever behind concrete walls. The delta has no way to reach it, even as it needs it more than ever. At the end of the system, all the effects come together. Marshes lose land, salt water moves inland, subsidence continues. When storms arrive, energy is no longer absorbed by ecosystems, but is driven straight into communities. On paper, flood control works better than ever. On the ground, the land grows more fragile each year. For thousands of years, the Mississippi adjusted itself. When floods came, it spread. When waters receded, land grew. Today, that rhythm has been replaced by switches and schedules. The river still flows across America, but it is no longer allowed to do what created it. And when a river's heart is held back long enough, the downstream does not need another blow to weaken. It only needs to keep missing what once arrived freely, reliably, with every flood season. As yearly satellite maps showed Louisiana's delta thinning faster than predicted, people were forced to face a difficult question. If levees built over a century could not be removed, if hundreds of upstream dams could not be dismantled, how could the delta regain what created it? The answer appeared as a modest sounding option, open a gap. Instead of sending all Mississippi sediment straight into deep water, engineers proposed allowing part of the river to return to marshes in a controlled way. Not free flooding like the past, but sediment diversions calculated with models and data. The largest proposal targeted the Barataria Basin southwest of New Orleans. In theory, this was the most direct way to correct a long-standing mistake. River sediment could thicken marsh foundations, slowly raise land, and help ecosystems repair old wounds. The Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority viewed it as a rare chance for the delta to keep pace with subsidence and sea level rise. Without sediment, land loss would continue. With it, at least hope remained. 
But once plans met daily life, a new paradox emerged. To save land, river water must flood marshes. When river water arrives, salinity changes. For ecosystems, this is natural. For people who depend on these waters, especially oyster and shrimp communities, it is immediate risk. Generations of work could be disrupted within a few seasons. Supporters spoke of the long-term future of land. Opponents spoke of meals on the table. Neither side was fully wrong. That is what locked the debate in place. As arguments dragged on, costs rose and politics deepened. The largest project was halted. The gap meant to unlock the river was closed again. The Mississippi continued to flow straight to sea while the Delta kept thinning year by year. The Barataria story is not just a, about a stalled project. It shows the cost of fixing damage too late. When humans alter a system for long enough, attempts to repair it force someone to carry risk first. While debate continues, nature does not wait for agreement. When an ecosystem is worn down long enough, nature no longer needs to issue clear warnings. It begins adjusting on its own. In the Mississippi Delta, that adjustment does not arrive as a single violent moment, but through small, repeated changes, until avoidance is no longer possible. Storms in the Gulf of Mexico are not necessarily more frequent in memory. Their impact is different. With marshes gone, nothing absorbs wave energy. Water rises higher, moves farther inland, faster. Places that once worried only during major storms now flood even in moderate conditions. The effects seep into everyday life. Salt water moves inland and threatens freshwater supplies. Farmland becomes saline. Roads and foundations deteriorate faster as land sinks slowly but constantly. Levees built for an older world reveal their limits. For many families, risk does not arrive as disaster but as cost. Insurance rises year after year. Home repairs become routine expenses. In some places, staying is no longer an economic choice, only a delay of departure long expected. What stands out is the absence of a single dramatic moment to wake everyone at once. The delta does not collapse in a day. It wears away. Because it happens slowly, each change feels manageable until together they form an undeniable reality. The Mississippi once symbolized abundance and stability. Today it reflects the price of over-control. There is no clear villain. No single decision caused everything. Just layers of reasonable choices stacked in a system not built to reverse course. At this point, what remains is not a simple solution, but a hard choice. Continue reinforcing what exists, accepting rising costs to hold the line. Or change how life unfolds with the river, accepting short-term risk for long-term hope. Whatever the choice, the Mississippi Delta has made one thing clear. When nature sends the bill, it arrives late, but it never misses the address. Thanks a lot for sticking with us till the very end. If you found this video useful, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe so you won't miss any of our daily uploads. And now, go ahead and explore some of our top recommended videos popping up on your screen. Goodbye, and see you in the next one.